I'm going to talk to you about the science visualization journey that I've had in my career to give you a perspective of how, how I develop the skill sets that I've gotten in terms of science visualization. It started when I was doing my master's degree in <coughs> University of Alaska and I was working on um, studying seagrasses in this uh, lagoon uh, next to the Bering Sea and <coughs> what you can see are these hand-drawn map and then a couple diagrams. And they were done with a thing called a rapidograph, a little black ink pen that um, you used uh, stippling for dots. And you can see that pretty crude uh, hand-drawn trees uh, in, in the, uh, the altitude diagram there. And then uh, when I went and did my PhD, I, I again used these uh, the same kind of technology, these little uh, rapidograph uh, diagrams, and then the the, work, the lettering is all done by a stencil. You would actually rub off letter by letter each of those stencils. You can see the water, the spacing between letters is a little goofy, but that said, they were effective. They were published as you know both papers and um, thesis. And then when I did my postdoc in Long Island, I, we were encountered this uh, novel algal bloom called the brown tide. And this was something that we had a conceptual diagram of, of what initiated the, t the brown tide, and that's the diagram on the lower right. And then the, the map there of the Long Island Sound and um, the coastal embayments was one that I just recently doing the Long Island Sound report card. I was Googling uh, Long Island maps and I found that this is is there in the uh, on the internet no 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 real good reference for what those uh, BP and I the different um, acronyms stood for but uh, it, it's amazing that the you know, 30 years later this thing still still exists um, <clears throat> but then when I uh, went to the University of Queensland in Australia and developed a marine botany group it was uh, kind of fortuitous but I had a, a a secretary assistant who was actually um, an art major and during her breaks uh, she'd come into the graduate student bullpen this is a graduate student office you can see here and there's a refrigerator and you see that old-fashioned refrigerator there and she started painting uh, sea grasses and mangroves and corals things that we were studying on the refrigerator and everybody would come in from the building and have a look and admire this great fridge and so we got her to uh, use that uh, her color graphics capability, and she quit being a secretary really and became a science communicator. And then we uh, evolved this uh, into a healthy waterways campaign using color graphics, and I'll show you some examples from that. But stemmed from that first uh, encounter with a, a colorful refrigerator. And then this is a book that we did, which was. Um, classic science textbook very thick and heavy black and white graphics pretty pretty nerdy um, and I think we only published 750 copies but we we, we, we ran 5,000 copies of this and then we're out of print within a year um, and this was a much shorter but colorful booklet called crew members guide and you can see that we started drawing these diagrams now these early diagrams were fairly crude we put a lot of words onto the diagram because we didn't have like standalone legends, uh, but we used colors and and um, icons to try to denote different processes, and it proved to be very popular. And one of the things we expanded on then, uh, when we developed the scientific synthesis, is that format of using a lot of visual color graphics. And you can see this, you know, a map here was one of the pages of this Morton Bay book and then followed up with a, a broader audience and used uh, a lot more maps and we, we, we were basically in this book saying don't trust don't take our word for it go go to these sites the places indicated in red either at mountaintop or a vantage point and see these processes for yourself and then we did another scientific book <coughs> again heavily uh, rich in graphics and um, and this is where we, we began to uh, expand this and say well we can do these for a lot of things so we could not just do books but we could do 
newsletters and posters and use, use these graphics and scientific uh, publications as well. And then uh, when I came back from Australia to the set, set up the Integration and Application Network, we really uh, pushed the idea of developing a web presence so that we could um, use uh, and share these skills and, and include the um, uh, training materials for other people to, to develop better science communication. So we created a symbol and image library, which has proven to be very popular, um, both in the number of people using it as well as the number of images down and, and symbols that were downloaded. And these symbols were all hand-drawn by science communicators for a particular use uh, and and now that we have this been going on for a while we've got a uh, uh, hundred thousand plus image and symbol library users uh, that have registered and downloaded those um, so you know we kind of uh, push this concept that there's both an art and, and a zen of science communication the art of science communication is taking a bunch of these visual elements, which we're going to be developing uh, in section one of the course, conceptual diagrams to provide context and synthesis, maps to provide ge geographic context and provide different layers of information, well-chosen photos to describe methods or the study site description or the processes and relevance, and then various tables and figures to illustrate scientific data using good science visualization techniques. And then <clears throat> equivalent to, to the art is the Zen, and that's to, to, to make an effort to do this well. Be enthusiastic about what you're trying to communicate, because if you're not excited, your audience isn't going to get excited either. Providing quality time to do it well, rather than just the night before, and a seeking out feedback and revision so that you can really make it better. And that revision and, and feedback is often not just from your peers, but from non-peers depending on your audience but if you're if you're if you're aiming for a broader audience than your your colleagues uh, your media colleagues then you want to share it out to a, a bigger audience <clears throat> one of the reasons for doing good science communication is it can make you a better scientist the process of doing good communication can hone your scientific skills it can make you develop a more complete story for example this diagram here of a, a um, uh, uh, harmful algal bloom uh, was was drawn from having to do with changes in forestry and the runoff of humic substances that uh, complexed with iron and then had a U ultraviolet light interaction to make it bioavailable to the uh, cyanobacteria. By by having this this diagram, we actually identified some missing pieces of science that we needed. So we went and found the right iron chemist and the right soil chemist to help us complete the story. Context, providing the linkages and developing comparisons can give you important insights, and that's uh, really um, you know really critical when you're dealing with. Um, uh, gradients and environmental gradients uh, like like a coastal gradient here and so you know knowing where you are in that gradient really helps you understand what the key processes are various visualizations can bring you uh, uh, new insights I remember combining a, a land use map with a stream health map and showing that I mean, it became very obvious that the degraded stream health was in all in the impervious built-up areas uh, and then synthesis, combining, comparing different data sets or approaches can lead to insights. And this one, this particular example is a Great Barrier Reef example where the Burdekin River was, uh, for the first time for us who had been studying the reef, very clearly the most degraded. I just recently, last week, uh, posted a blog on that topic so you can read that blog and get, a, get the whole story behind that. So my final statement here is this is an investment invest in good science communication it'll pay it rich dividends if you build up a library of high quality visual elements it'll it'll pay dividends over time they can be recycled for various media you do it you do it once for a particular use but you'll be able to reuse it in many future uses it helps convey good information 
it makes a great impression on your audience and it really can make a difference. If you communicate effectively, it can make a difference. So it's a good investment.